Welcome to this video on the cardiovascular system summary. The goal of this video is to give you a recap of how the entire cardiovascular system works in one video. Okay, so the cardiovascular system has two circulations. There's the pulmonary circulation, and its purpose is to pump blood to the lungs for gas exchange. So let's write lungs in orange, and we'll compare that with the systemic circulation, and its purpose is to pump blood to all of the body cells for oxygen delivery, as well as um, br uh, bringing nutrients and carrying away waste. Okay, so when we look at um, the heart, let's go ahead and start with the pulmonary circulation, and the blood in the, in the heart, the right side, is deoxygenated. So the right atrium, is deoxygenated and blood goes through the AV valve, which we'll talk about in a second, to the right ventricle. And then from that point, when the heart beats, the blood goes up and out to the lungs through the pulmonary arteries. So let's go ahead and write this down. So the right ventricle pumps deoxygenated blood out through the pulmonary arteries, and these are vessels that are going away from the heart. In this case, they're deoxygenated. And then they go into uh, pulmonary arterioles, which are small blood vessels, small arteries, that regulate blood flow. So when you're exercising, these will dilate to bring more blood, and when you are resting, they will constrict. And then they go from there into the pulmonary capillaries. And the pulmonary capillaries is where the magic happens. This is the site of gas exchange. Oxygen enters the capillaries and carbon dioxide leaves. So because of that, I want you to take a pink highlighter and highlight pulmonary capillaries, because this is where gas exchange then occurs. Then after this, we'll use a pink pen because the blood is now oxygenated and it comes back through, so it goes out the pulmonary capillaries into um, small veins and then into the pulmonary veins, which are oxygenated blood vessels going back to the heart. And then they enter the left atrium and they've now completed the whole circle where it went right atrium, right ventricle, pulmonary arteries to the lungs, and then oxygenated blood returning to the heart through the pulmonary veins. This chamber right here is the, oops, sorry, is the left atrium and then oxygenated blood flows down through that uh, bicuspid valve into the left ventricle. So now we're ready to talk about the systemic circulation. So the systemic circulation begins from the left ventricle and it pumps blood up and out the biggest artery in your body, which is called the aorta. And as you can see, there are a lot of little blood vessels coming off the aorta. Not so little, actually. The first ones are the coronary arteries, so the heart gets first dibs on the oxygenated blood. And then you have three coming off the top of the arch that go to the rest of the upper body. And then the blood goes down, and later on this blood vessel is called the abdominal aorta, and it can deliver all of the blood to the different organs, such as the kidneys. Okay, so the aorta has um, very high pressure. And in fact, um, this is essentially where you can get your reading for what blood pressure is. So I'm going to take a purple pen, and the ventricle is pumping a particular pressure, and that systolic pressure is the pressure that the heart is able to exert when it ejects blood. So that's going to be that top value. Uh, so this is the ventricular force, the pressure that it builds up in order to push the blood out, and it's typically going to be about 120 millimeters of mercury. That's why you've seen blood pressure as 120 over 80, for example. This means 
the uh, left ventricle built up to 120 millimeters of mercury to push the blood out. And then when it's relaxing in between beats, the pressure in here is only 80 millimeters of mercury. We measure this indirectly on someone's arm, but you're taking that from an artery that's coming off from you know, the top of the arch. And so it's an indirect measurement, but it gives you a very good idea of what the pressure actually is in the left ventricle. Okay, so back to our um, systemic circulation. So from the aorta, then there's a bunch of smaller arteries, like the renal artery, for example. And then these continue to branch into smaller and smaller arteries until you get to the arterioles. And just like I told you um, for the pulmonary circulation, the arterioles are critical for regulating flow. So for example, if you're exercising, the arterioles to your skeletal muscles in your legs would dilate and allow more blood flow to go there. And at the same time, the arterioles leading to the kidneys would um, constrict, so there would be less blood flow to the kidneys at that time. Okay, so um, then after the arterioles, just like the pulmonary circulation, now you go to the systemic capillaries. These are microscopic blood vessels, and they this is where exchange occurs. So oxygen gets dropped off, Carbon dioxide gets picked up, nutrients get dropped off, and uh, waste get picked up. So now take your blue highlighter to show that this is where that exchange happens. And now we have deoxygenated blood that will return to the heart via veins. So these capillaries drain into veins, and veins are blood vessels that are returning to the heart and the veins get bigger and bigger until you get to the largest vein called the vena cava that then dumps back in to the right atrium and we've completed the entire systemic circulation at this point. So the vena cava and well, actually all veins have low pressure and the pressure is so low that they have valves to prevent backflow. And let's uh, keep talking about valves for just a second. So not only do veins need to have valves to prevent backflow, but you have valves in the heart. So separating the atria from the ventricles are the atrioventricular valves. The one on the left side of the heart has two flaps, so we call it the bicuspid because bi means two. And the one on the right side of the heart has three flaps, so we call it the tricuspid. And these are valves that prevent backflow when the ventricles contract. And I'll show you what I mean by this. So when the left and the right ventricle contract, blood has just come into them from their atria and they're squeezing upward. And when they're squeezing upward, blood needs to go into the aorta on the left side and into the pulmonary artery on the right side. And the, um, the valves here have to shut. If they didn't, then blood would go back into the atrium and that would be called a mitral valve regurgitation or a heart murmur or something. There are also valves in the pulmonary artery and in the aorta and they're called the pulmonary semilunar valve and the aortic semilunar valve. Okay, so next I want to explain briefly how electrical activity is conducted through the heart. So starting in the right atrium, there are some autorhythmic cells called the SA node that will automatically generate an action potential and it spreads all through the nearby cells so that all these cells become depolarized. And then if they're able to, if in a healthy heart, then eventually they get to another bunch of autorhythmic cells called the AV node. It's at the bottom of the atrium where the ventricle joins together. So it's sort of that juncture. And together, um, you can take a purple highlighter. This causes the entire 
Um, so it's because it's spreading out this way like that. All of the atria is now able to depolarize. And that means it's going to contract in a second. So this would be the P wave over here on what's called an ECG, where if you hook electrodes up to someone's chest, then you can see um, this electrical activity. And this little bump right here represents depolarization of the atria that occurred at that time. Okay, so then once the signal gets down to the ventricles, there's the bundle of Hiss, which kind of up in there, and then the bundle branches, so the depolarization continues down what's called the septum, the middle of the heart, and then the Purkinje fibers are cells that then pass the signal up and the outside. Now the cool trick here is that by going up the outside like this, when the muscle then contracts a moment later, it will press the blood up and out the aorta and the pulmonary uh, trunk. And so it kind of squeezes from the bottom up. Okay, so this is the QRS complex. And that's right here. Sorry, my dog was uh, not happy with one of my cats. He likes to be in charge of them. Uh, one of them, he thought one of them was getting out of line. So, all right, so next, um, uh, let's see, I have this. I think we're ready to move down. So the heart is autorhythmic, which means that it can beat on its own. I'll use my green pen here. Even if you cut off all of the nerves that go from the brain to the heart, it would still be able to beat on its own. Now, it wouldn't have a lot of modulation. It would probably always go around 75 beats a minute, but it would be able to keep beating on its own, just like certain neurons can in the brain. But that's not what is happening in a healthy person that has nerves. You have parasympathetic nerve fibers coming down the vagus nerve, and they deliver a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine onto the SA node, and that slows the heart down. So it's gonna make the electrical signal go through more slowly. Sympathetic nerves, on the other hand, coming from the spinal cord, they deliver norepinephrine, and that neurotransmitter will speed the heart up by making the sinoatrial node go faster. And so you're gonna get a faster electrical signal, and then this whole process will be a little bit scrunched up and faster. But there are also hormones in the bloodstream that can affect heart rate, and the ones that you've probably heard of, um, like epinephrine, or also known as adrenaline, and then maybe one you've possibly heard of, thyroxin is the hormone that is able to speed up, um, speed up the heart too, because it's a metabolic hormone that makes, uh, makes the heart make more ATP and do more of its stuff. Okay, so now let's go to the bottom here and we'll look at a blood vessel because the point of this page is to explain the cardiovascular system as succinctly as I can. And I see that that breaks down into, first of all, knowing the parts of the heart and the blood flow through, through the pulmonary circulation as well as the blood flow through the systemic circulation, knowing which times the blood's oxygenated, which times the blood is deoxygenated. Then you should have a general understanding of how the conduction system works. And lastly, you should know what's in blood. So blood is considered um, part of the cardiovascular system. And we're gonna start with the cells that are in blood. So the formed elements of blood are the cells. And then the watery components are part of the plasma. So go ahead and take your um, pink highlighter. And of course, we have to start with red blood cells. So red blood cells are also known as erythrocytes and we'll write their function in pink right here. So erythrocytes' whole function in life is to carry oxygen. Now they can do this because they are light and flexible, they have no nucleus, and they instead are crammed with a protein called hemoglobin, and that's the protein that actually binds to the oxygen. So this oxyhemoglobin bond and there's iron in each one of these hemoglobins. 
Hold on one second, I need to pause this. Okay, we're back in business. My nine-year-old um, is a very, very good whistler, but he, um, I don't think, realized he was doing a lot of whistling. Okay, so um, the erythrocytes carry oxygen, and the hemoglobin um, has iron in it that actually can bind to the oxygen. So then um, I'll come back to that in a second, but next I want to look at leukocytes. These are white blood cells, and actually most of the white blood cells in your body are in your tissues. I think maybe only like 2 or 3% of them are circulating in the blood. So that's a small amount. And they have the sole job of fighting infection in, um, against invaders. And they are able to leave the bloodstream and enter the tissues when they sense the chemical signature of a wound or an infection or something like that. So they're able to leave the blood. Oops, sorry, let me move this up just a little bit. Okay, so they're able to leave the blood at the wound or infection site. Okay. Now, the last kind of um, formed element or cellular component in blood are thrombocytes. I'll go ahead and highlight these in green. So thrombocytes, thrombocytes, thrombocytes. Thrombocytes are really just platelets. And so their whole goal in life is to help with blood clotting, or sometimes we call this hemostasis. But they can't do it on, oh, and they're just cell fragments. That's why they're so tiny. They're just little fragments of cells. They can't do it on their own, though. They, and that's good, because you don't want these to start clumping and sticking together unless they need to. So use your green highlighter again, and we will highlight their partner in crime. So these represent uh, chemicals in the plasma that are called clotting factors. And these include enzymes, proteins, um, clotting in various small chemicals that can make platelets clump. Sorry, clotting factors can make platelets clump. Okay, then next up, there are a lot of nutrients in the bloodstream. So you've got glucose, you've got fatty acids, you've got amino acids, and these are carried in the blood to the organs that need them. Next, water. About 90% of plasma is actually water. So it's a very watery environment. And then one of my favorites, there are lots and lots of hormones in the blood, whether it's insulin or growth hormone or thyroxine. And these hormones uh, travel in the blood until they reach their target tissue where they can bind to receptors there. So, you know, just to give you a couple reminders, you got epinephrine, thyroxine, and um, maybe growth hormone. Lots of different hormones. I have a video going summarizing the um, endocrine system somewhere. Okay, so then the antibodies are also circulating in the blood to keep you safe. Part of your immune functions. Next, I'd like to color the endothelial cells green. So your blood vessels are lined with cells called endothelial cells. I'll make all of these green. And these are simple squamous epithelial cells. So if you go over here, endo means inside. Thelium is like the blood vessel, basically. And if you remember back into your tissue work, these are simple squamous epithelial cells, which means that they're very flat. And that is why they're good at allowing exchange. So Go ahead and finish putting the green on here. I'm both kind of sad and kind of excited that some of my pens are dying because that means that 
I have to spend more on pens, but it also means I get to get new pens and I love to get new pens. So then highlight this yellow tissue cell down here. This could represent any cell in your body that the capillaries are bringing goodies to. And then remember we were talking about the oxygen that's carried on the hemoglobin it's, that's inside of the red blood cells. So that oxygen is released from the red blood cell when it enters tissues that need it. And then it simply diffuses through the simple squamous cell and then through the membrane of the tissue cell to bring oxygen into the cell. With the same process, carbon dioxide that's made by this cell in the process of cellular respiration is able to diffuse out into the bloodstream to be carried away. Any products that this tissue cell makes or other waste products can also be carried away at this point. So next I will show you the smooth muscle. Not all blood vessels have a lot of smooth muscle. Capillaries don't have any. So if this were a capillary, there would be no smooth muscle. But um, if you imagine that this were an arterial, man, there would be a lot of smooth muscle because arterioles are the ones that constrict and dilate the most to regulate blood flow. So let's go ahead and finish that. And then put right here, um, arterioles are hands down the most important in, in this process. to regulate blood flow. And by doing that, by regulating blood flow, by limiting flow to an organ or increasing flow to an organ, then what they do is they have the greatest impact on regulating blood pressure. So arterioles will have a lot of smooth muscle for constricting and dilating. Arteries will have a lot of smooth muscle so um, the arteries would, and they need it because the pressure is really high in them, and otherwise they might actually rip, and that's what an aneurysm is, is when a blood vessel uh, starts to kind of it, it get a weakened spot in its wall where the smooth muscle can't hold in again anymore. And then veins will even have smooth muscle, although they maybe tend to not have as much, and then remember they have valves as well. So... Um, and then capillaries will have no, let's just maybe put one point here. So capillaries lack smooth muscle because if they had it, then the stuff couldn't diffuse in and out like it needs to. Okay, I think that we've covered most of what I wanted to do in this video. I'm going to zoom out on this one. So I actually went faster than I thought I would, which is great. Um, hope I didn't talk too terribly fast.